News First. This is ABC 7 Extra. Good evening, I'm Saul Sainz, and this is ABC 7 Extra Sunday Edition. Just when we thought COVID-19 cases were dropping, cases, cases are starting to soar once again with a record number of cases Thursday. Hospitalization, hospitalization rates are also high. To the point, County Judge Ricardo Samaniego asked Governor Greg Abbott to exempt El Paso from his order, the governor's order, for bars to open. Still, the governor did say businesses can expand their capacity. Schools from almost every school district are scaling back the return to in-classroom instruction because of rising cases. Some districts are even putting the pause button on sports like football. Joining us to talk about all these rising rates is Del Sol Medical Center Chief Medical Officer and Infectious Disease Expert, Dr. Ogachika Alozi. Thank you so much. You're so gracious with your time, doctor. Tell us your concern about the rising numbers. First of all, thanks for having me. I mean, I'm sad and disheartened at where we are. If we look at the work that our community put in just four weeks ago, right? We were at some of our lowest levels around positivity rates of 4%, cases per 100,000 below 10. And in a quick four weeks, we're above 30 cases per 100,000 and our positivity rate is 12 to 13. And so we're really, really worried about what's going on going into the fall. This is really disappointing and kind of scary. Yep. Your opinion on uh, uh, Judge uh, Samaniego saying, look, we can't open our bars right now. Good, good decision, bad decision? I think it's really clear, right? So congregate settings, whether it's bars, and I understand the sort of discord around a bar versus a restaurant, but anywhere that people are going, that they're crowded, that alcohol is involved, which disinhibits us and makes us remove our masks, right, is not the best option. And here's the thing. We set the guidelines, right, whether it's the community, the county, the city, the state, we set guidelines 14 days in a row of improving numbers. We have 14 days in a row of worsening numbers. So we're literally going contrary against what we set. So again, reasonable people can argue Saul about whether a restaurant is a bar or a bar is a restaurant, but here's what's clear. We're not getting better in 14 days in a row, and so it doesn't make sense to do anything different. So do you think we need stronger enforcement of some of these same guidelines that have been set? Again, I sort of leave that for the politicians. I focus on the science and the health data, and the health data shows that we're getting worse. If we acknowledge we're getting worse, then reasonable people have to sit down and say, what are the things that we need to change to ensure that we get better? whether it's reducing movement, whether it's reducing the opening of various facilities, be they restaurants or bars. And I mean, there's a conversation and controversy around schools. There's a great article in The Atlantic that came out on Thursday or Friday that actually talks about schools not being super spreader events, right? There are other people that disagree. I think in terms of schools, it all depends on where you stand in there, right? Some parents don't need to send their kids to school because they have the Ability to provide various things for them at home. Other people don't, whether it's food insecurity, whether there's technological insecurity. And so I completely understand that the school districts, the teachers, and the parents are in a very tough situation. But as a city and a county and a community, we have to do something different because the last four weeks have not worked for us. Let me turn that question around for you then. What is it that we should be doing differently? Should we be expanding the capacity of businesses right now? I think the data would suggest that we shouldn't. The data shows that as we've expanded, as we've opened things up more and more, we've gotten worse. And so the city and the county need to make a decision. And that decision is what's more important. Is it more important for people to be out and about and businesses to operate at 40 and 50% capacity, which in reality doesn't cover most of their overhead? Or is it more important for us to get these numbers down to a point in our community that we can get our kids back to school, that we can get those parents that can't return to work until their kids are in school let them get back to work. We need to make decisions around what's important to our community. And that's really what this is going to boil down to. In the minute that we have left in this segment, tell me about contact uh, tracing. Should we be doing more of it? Should we be having more people out there doing contact tracing to, to make sure that we know where this is happening and obviously take effective measures? 
Yeah, contact tracing is hard, right? It's, first of all, it's not easy. People think that it's just a question of calling somebody that's positive and asking them a bunch of questions. Um, the estimate is between 30 and 50% of people that are positive, they get a contact tracing call, they don't answer their phone. And so that's one problem. The other thing, and again, it's where the community has to take responsibility about how we get these numbers down. When the numbers are low, when we're at 50 to 100 cases a day, the city has the resources to do adequate contact tracing. Once we blow past 200, 300, 400, 500 that we saw this week, it technically becomes almost impossible to contact trace. And so that's part of the problem. The more cases we have, the harder it becomes to contact trace and the more chains of infection exist. Okay, Dr. Elozzi, we're going to take a really quick break. This is ABC7 Extra. When we come back, I'll ask Dr. Elozzi about the possibility of a twindemic, the medical community dealing with influenza and COVID-19 at the same time. You're watching ABC7 Extra, where news comes first. After getting shot during a mission in Afghanistan, you'd have thought I'd seen the worst. But here we are. Families on lockdown, communities torn apart. Because Washington politicians like John Cornyn made the wrong decisions early on, worried more about politics than saving lives. Well, I'm MJ Hagar, and I'll listen to the experts and fight for quality, affordable health care for every Texan. I approved this message because my mission isn't finished until all of our families are safe. The pandemic has taught us that what is most essential is being with our loved ones and having access to health care, food, steady income, safe housing, and technology. It has also taught us that our border community needs leadership that knows how to deal with the crisis. El Paso deserves a hardworking leader ready to face challenges with practical solutions and compassion. We need someone who is ready to fight for all El Pasoans in a more just future. I am Veronica Carvajal, and as your mayor, I will fight for you. You've seen a lot of her ads. But there are three things to remember. Xochitl Torres Small votes with Nancy Pelosi 95% of the time. She votes with anti-oil and gas extremists 97% of the time. And Torres Small earned a D from the NRA. 95% with Pelosi, 97% with anti-oil and gas extremists, and a D from the NRA. It's easy to remember. It's easy to vote against Xochitl Torres Small. Congressional Leadership Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. I'm Gina Ortiz-Jones, and this is my story. It starts with my mom coming to America, then escaping an abusive husband to protect her girls. I grew up here in San Antonio, and I learned to work hard. John Jay High School, ROTC scholarship, Air Force, Iraq, and when mom got cancer, I came home to help. It all shaped who I am today. But I approve this message because how we shape our future matters more. Welcome back to ABC7 Extra. While Governor Abbott is calling on businesses to increase their capacity and Texas schools going to in-person instruction, New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham is going in the opposite direction. Thursday, she cited the loss of a high school teacher to COVID-19. Because it's a very challenging environment to have in-person learning and a virus. And of course, uh, our uh, thoughts and prayers with the, the educator that we lost in Gadsden to this virus. Uh, we are seeing more and more students impacted around the country. I also want to welcome back infectious disease expert Dr. Ogachika Lozi. Later in the program, we'll be joined by the El Paso Chamber of Commerce CEO and President David Jerome. First of all, Dr. Lozi, welcome back. Let's talk about the possibility of a twindemic. Concerning? So definitely concerning, but I think part of this conversation is potentially theoretical. If you look at the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, they're actually down 90 to 95 percent in their influenza cases. A lot of it is because they've put in the work around masking, physical distancing, and a host of other mitigation processes. I think the other thing to really look at is that air travel, which is one of the ways that influenza moves from the Southern Hemisphere to the United States, has been curtailed. It's probably down 50 or more percent. Those two things together give us hope that potentially influenza will not be as catastrophic as it could have been alongside coronavirus. I think it's also important to understand, however, that hope is not a strategy, right? So the hospitals, whether it's my hospital and our community partners across the city, are putting in the work to ensure that we have adequate COVID testing, we have adequate influenza testing, that our staff and our teams are trained and ready 
to triage those patients coming in, whether it's getting an influenza and a COVID first, and then making a determination of who needs to be in the hospital and who needs to go home. So I actually do feel that we will be ready. And as long as we continue our mitigation efforts, we should be okay. Uh, unfortunately, it sounds like we've already dropped the ball by virtue of the fact that we have some numbers that are already rising. They're going in the wrong direction. Something that you probably don't want to talk about, but what is the worst case scenario if we have a twindemic? Well, the worst case scenario is really clearly this. So what people don't understand is that in December and January, most healthcare systems, not only in our city, but across the country, that's when they're at max capacity. And it's not max capacity because of surgeries or anything else. It's influenza that takes them to their highest census. If you take influenza and then add to the average hospital here um, that is already seeing numbers go up, you then have that sort of tipping point scenario of being overwhelmed. I believe we won't get there because our influenza numbers are down. I think it's important for the community to understand that because influenza is down doesn't mean we should allow coronavirus to go up, right? And so hopefully we won't get there, but we can need to continue to ensure that from a mitigation standpoint that we're doing the right things for our community. As a member of the governor's task force on the battle against COVID-19, what are some of the recommendations that you're offering to the governor specifically in relation to El Paso? Yeah, so the Governor's Task Force on Infectious Disease Preparedness, it's an honor to be on it. I hope to um, represent our community the best that I can. We haven't met yet. I think that there's a host of really smart people, smarter than I am, that are on that committee. I doubt it. <laughs> it's just looking at the data, right? Again, I try as much as possible, and you know this because you tried to trap me before. I try to stay out of the politics of it, but lead with the science, lead with the data, and let the politicians who are elected make some of those decisions. Our job is to give the governor and his office um, sort of the best recommendations around a host of things. It's not just coronavirus. It's things like Ebola, how are we prepared for PPE in the state? How are we prepared for testing? How do we prepare to be a next generation state around health information technology, right? So we can stop sending faxes from one hospital to another if we need information. Those are all the things we're going to focus on. And um, again, I'm honored to serve. Um, a very eloquent response. However, <laughs> what would be some of the recommendations? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat the question. What are some of the recommendations you're going to make to the governor to help us out here in El Paso to maybe bring down those numbers? Is there anything that you can say to the governor uh, specifically in relation to El Paso that can help us in that direction? Yeah, I think if you look at El Paso right now, we are different than some of the other cities in the state because our numbers seem to have gone up at a faster rate. Because they're going up at a faster rate, I think an exclusion to allow us to slow things down and not open up as quickly, I think it makes common sense. Again, you got to go back to July and August. When we're at our peak numbers and we saw that decline, it was because people deliberately were not moving about. They were not going out to congregate facilities, be it bars, restaurants, or having gatherings. As we've relaxed and people have gotten tired, these cases have gone up. And so asking for an exclusion to allow us to slow down in terms of what we open up. Really pushing the education message and the compliance around masking and potential physical distancing, I think, is important. We're not getting through this if we actually pretend that it's just going to magically disappear. And so I think those are some of the things that we have to do. And I, like you said, the judge has already asked the governor for an exclusion. And let's see how that goes. Thank you for being candid with that, 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 that second answer. Now, the mayor says that these numbers are not due to Labor Day celebrations, rather than uh, to community spread. Do you believe that, too? And what can be done to reduce community spread? I mean, I'm not here to disagree with the mayor, right? But I think the data shows that if you look at from Labor Day onwards, we've had a sort of increase in our slope. Whether it's driven by Labor Day, we can argue about that. Whether it's driven by potential schools reopening in various zip codes, I think that's part of it. I think part of it is also just the sort of aggregate movement of people going out more and being encouraged to go out more potentially because they felt as if, oh, our numbers are great, we feel safe. I think that's part of the problem. Again, there was an article in the Atlantic back in March or April called The Hammer and the Dance. Every time we hammer down with masking and sh shutting um, congregate facilities down, then we start this dance of opening up. 
we have to figure out what's that calibration between the hammer and the dance to get to a point where our numbers are low enough that our kids can go back to school, that parents can go back to work, and that we can feel safe in our community. And if we do need to go out, we do it in a safe manner. Dr. Ogichi thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. I hope you enjoy the rest you. of your Sunday evening. You as well. Right. We are watching ABC 7 and Extra. When we come back, we'll be joined by El Paso Chamber of Commerce CEO and President David Jerome. I'll ask him about the governor's decision to open bars in other parts of Texas and expand the capacity of statewide businesses. We'll be back. The last three months of my active duty military service, I was in charge of conducting military funerals having to give this folded flag to a girl who lost her dad. There's nothing you could tell this girl about their parent being gone. President Trump just doesn't understand. I am from a multi-generational military family. To think that somebody would call them suckers and losers, it's incredibly disrespectful to every person who's ever worn that uniform, to every person who was the child of a mother, father, brother. He just doesn't understand what it means to do something that you think is more important than just yourself. And this country is more important than him, than me, coming together is what's important. Joe Biden's a unifier. His son was one of us. It takes a lot to be able to send your own child off to war. Joe Biden understands that decision. He understands sacrifice. He's experienced loss, and those losses allow growth. I believe that Joe Biden is the man for this time. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. The unknown is not empty. It's a storm that crashes and consumes, replacing thought with worry. But one thing can calm uncertainty, an answer. Uncovered through exploration, teamwork, and innovation. An answer that leads to even more answers. Mayo Clinic, you know where to go. I'm Mayor D. Margo. Since my election three years ago, our city has faced many successes and many challenges. Through it all, my commitment to El Paso has remained steadfast. And I have full confidence and hope that we will again come together as before. We will continue to be a symbol of hope on the border for all to see. With your support, I will continue my commitment to serve you throughout a second term. I'm Mayor D. Margo, and I approve this message. Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra Sunday Edition. I also want to welcome El Paso Chamber of Commerce CEO and President David Jerome. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us, Mr. Jerome. Uh, we want to talk to you about uh, the COVID-19 situation and businesses opening up. Governor Abbott on Thursday essentially said that more businesses can increase their capacity. Uh, but however, we still have some rising numbers in El Paso. Your thoughts on that, sir? Well, I think there's a cost on both sides of this. I mean, clearly, um, uh, I would say, though, that, that uh, you know, if you open too fast and people get too sick, it hurts the economy and hurts businesses. And not opening and closing the economy down is, is obviously also a, a big problem. So this is not an easy decision, I think, on either side. Um, there's cost on both. Um, but I do think right now uh, people's health is paramount. And uh, that's really where it should be. And I think business and most of our folks uh, one would be obviously very willing to defer to the experts like Dr. Alosi, but also to make sure that we are doing everything within our power to make sure things don't go backwards. I think this is a very important time to remain vigilant. It's very hard for folks. This has been a long slog already, but you know, wearing a mask, social distancing, washing your hands, these things are more important now than ever. And if we don't want to have uh, a situation where we go backwards, we have to remain vigilant. Does the chamber uh, discuss this with some of the businesses who are members of the Chamber of Commerce and advise them on what it is that they need to be doing or at least monitoring some of these businesses? Yeah, we do actually. It's we have a you know we have a thousand four hundred members. We're the largest business organization in town. I think the oldest one too. We've been around for over one hundred and twenty-one years now, and um, so you know this isn't our first 
pandemic, funny enough, if you think about it from that perspective. However, I think a lot of the knowledge and thought uh, from the past is, you know, something that's been hard to transfer uh, to us now. I mean, just as an example, but I think the I think the businesses now we talk to them a great deal. We survey them, but we also we also talk to them almost every day um, by calling them directly. And we're also, um, you know, they're calling us asking for help. And so this is something that we, um, you know, we have a lot of ways to, to, to learn what's going on out there from direct interaction with our members, from surveys that we do and, and other things. So we're, we're pretty much aware of how they feel about it. And it's been difficult. This is no, no, uh, no question, but we're also clearly at a K recovery as they call it. You know, some people are doing well and a lot of others are suffering and being empathetic and working with those that are suffering while we're also trying to help um, them is the real focus uh, that we have at the moment. Any idea of the number of businesses in El Paso that have been forced to close permanently because of the pandemic? Okay, so that, that's a really great question and not an easy one to answer, but I will venture a guess because we do have an idea and we do try to track these things as best we can from our members and other sources that we have uh, in terms of you know speaking with other organizations in the city and the county and others, but we estimate about 300 companies have closed. Wow. There's a great deal of discussion going on right now in the nation's capital about another stimulus plan to try to help some of these businesses come out of their rut because of the pandemic. Um, your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think most economists are saying that this is a good idea. I mean, we're talking between two, I mean, one and two trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. Um, but I do think that um, we'd like to see it make its way into the economy. I think it would help a lot of folks. And we don't want to see uh, the U.S. economy, or particularly our local economy, stressed to the point that it's really hard to come back. And a lot of people, you know, when you think about something like COVID-19, it's very much more akin uh, to a natural disaster than it is previous sort of financial difficulties that have resulted like in the Great Depression or the Great Recession. This one is like a prolonged natural disaster. So there isn't like an underlying problem with the economy. There is literally a health care crisis that has led to a economic crisis. And so uh, we want to try to make sure that people who are otherwise running a, a reasonable or good business aren't aren't in a position where they can't bounce back as quickly as possible. So we'd like to see that stimulus come. We think it's important. And um, we've been, you know, this is important to note because everybody can be uh, looking at these things in, you know, the most difficult way, but we've been working very effectively with the city and the county and other business partners in town to deal with this. And I, I mean, my hat's off to the city and the county for all the work that they've done. And, and I think, you know, we've been there to try to make sure that we have uh, helped business as well uh, in the ways that we do. I think just like last last month in September, we worked with 20 companies to keep them afloat um, on various different ways um, from getting them loans to making sure they have the information they need to make smart decisions in, in keeping their business afloat. And so everybody's trying and everybody's working very hard. Um, and, um, you know, truthfully, I think you know, a little bit more money in the system would be a, a nice way for us to make sure that all these efforts are not for want. You know, we've done all this work now. I don't want to see it disappear because of lack of support from D.C. Right. What are you saying to bar owners or what are bar our owners telling you because of the county judge's decision to send a letter to Governor Greg Abbott saying El Paso should be exempt from reopening bars. Are bar owners talking to you about this? Some are. I mean, um, I think people are tend to be um, truthfully, you know, we talk about heroes all the time, first responders and others. Um, the, the heroes to me, though, are not the obvious, obvious that we always point out. And I think rightfully so. I mean, Clearly, folks like Dr. Losi in the hospitals and and the first responders, these are true heroes. They put their life on the line in terms of, you know, potentially contracting a deadly disease to take care of all of us. 
clearly. But another level of heroes are all these folks that are struggling to keep the economy running by keeping their businesses open, you know, worrying about that 24 seven, their employees, their customers and things of this sort. It's an amazing uh, thing to consider. And they've done an amazing job. And I, I would say, you know, I've encountered owners of different businesses from restaurants to hotels to, you know, these uh, bar owners as well. Some are thinking, you know, they want to be careful not to put in the processes and procedures in place to make sure people don't get sick. I, I, you know, it's it's not easy, and right. I do think the healthcare officials and the and the experts on this need to be listened to. And uh, a lot of people agree with that. Some don't, as you can imagine. But nonetheless, we're we're where we are, and um, I I just don't want to see us go backwards. I think that would be the worst thing. So if we need to make a couple of um, you know very hard choices, um, we've been doing it already, um, and we may have to do it for a bit longer. Um, but we've made progress. Things have gotten better. Although recently, obviously in El Paso, we've seen an increase in cases. Right. Um, we we need to be vigilant and going backwards is is not where I want to be. So if we got a slow opening up to keep from going backwards, I think that's probably the right trade-off. Okay, Mr. Jerome, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us, CEO and President of uh, the El Paso Chamber of Commerce. I appreciate you taking time to talk to us. Likewise. Thanks for letting us know, and uh, and thank you for uh, helping getting good information out there. It's extremely important at this time, so thank you. A real pleasure to be part of this. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching ABC 7 Extra Sunday Edition. Good night y buenas noches.